Hello and welcome to what will be the last normal Footlock episode of the year. We've got one more episode to come before the end of 2018 with some extra special bits. But for now, I'm joined by my Footlock friend, Mr. Henry Catchball. Hello, Drew Stern. And we have a great episode to cram in a lot of the things that we've been up to. But I want to jump straight in. Uh, with uh, a film that we put out very recently, you were able to go to the unveil of the new Porsche 911 992. Mm, it was actually it was before the unveil, so it was we we filmed it. It was obviously unveiled out in LA. That's right. Uh, when the world's press got to see it for the first time, but we we snuck in a bit early, sort of about Ooh. ten days early, in fact. under the cover of darkness, uh, with something like that. So it was an early <laughs> flight anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, we went to the studio and, and saw the new Porsche 911 992 generation. Now, this is the eighth generation of 911, and that's just counting the major mm -hmm. stops, not even counting the in-between halfway stops. That I did have to go away and look that up, because yeah. it's one of the things you see there. Can thinking. you name them all? <laughs> Probably, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um, but this, so this follows on in the tradition of the 964, 993, 996, 997, 991, exactly, and now those, 992. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and where they go from here, who knows? But uh, as is the case with 911, it's an evolution in design rather than revolution. Um, it is dividing some people already, the, the exterior styling. What, what's your personal take on it? Uh, I think it looks very sleek. It's... It is an improvement. As soon as you see the new one, somehow the old one just looks a little bit sort of mm -hmm. dated yep. straight away, which is obviously exactly what they're trying to do. Um, I made a thing of the new door handles in the film. Very which nice. I can, yeah. They are very nice. <laughs> it feels so ridiculous. And I can't stress it. I really did sort of feel a bit stupid talking about door handles, but they just clean up the whole side of that car. The other thing with the 911 now is the front arches are much wider than mm. before. They're, I think, 45 millimeters wider than before. The whole car is uh, only a little bit wider because it's got the you're not getting a wider body for having the four-wheel drive now. They're all the same same size. I really like the tweaks to the rear. It's um, It's subtle enough that it doesn't completely depart from what we expect a 911 mm -hmm. rear to look. But there are quite a few little detail changes. Mm. So the, the the way the rear lights are being used, that little uh, rear brake light cluster in the middle of yeah. the spine kind of reminds me of what like um, Chiron has with its kind of spine light. Okay. Or, yeah. or um, more proportionately, what's on the back of the BAC mono that has its brake light kind of on yes. the rear. Yeah, the F1. Sort yeah, of like F1 style. The rain, um, rain light or whatever Yeah, it's. but not quite kind of as low down, like a little bit higher up, not in yeah. a place where you'd normally expect it. But then also the rear light that completely wraps around. Which is what everyone's side. talking about. Yeah. And it's something, that rear light bar is something that Porsche's had for a very long time, I think. So 959 had something similar and then it was on the 993 yeah, and, as well. Yeah, and even way back, I think some of the G-Series models probably had sort of, there were some of them that you know, but those were around in there. Those kind were of, chunky. Yeah, really chunky. Because like, yeah. those had... Well, you can get thin light, the thin lights. Exactly. Because you sort of, you know, they had some proper bulbs years, in them. Yeah, yeah, it's only the last few years you've had these sort of thin strip LEDs. Some people go, oh, I love that. And others just go, oh, what have they done? And Well, yeah, I mean, there it, you go. it's like the headlights on the 996. I think Think that was more universally disliked but it is <laughs> yeah. it is something where they make a decision to step forward i personally think it looks brilliant i think it, mm. it really gives it without necessarily completely throwing away the rule book on how to design a 911 a couple of nice modern touches yeah it does look much more modern much more sort of you can't really call it futuristic because it's a 911 therefore it's but, as futuristic but, as it can yeah i think so the rear does look very good i think well and that extends to the interior as well because they've yeah. it looks like they've taken that line that we saw developing on the panamera at first with a great new infotainment screen and Porsches had been a little bit behind in in certain aspects of the interior. I think the the mechanical buttons was the the blanked off plates for the options that you didn't buy. Yeah. Um. And the the Porsche media system, it it, it had some way to go. And then with the new Panamera, it looked fantastic. And that's slightly smaller version, but that looks like yeah. what you've got now. Yeah. It, it is. Uh, it looks looks great. I I love the the analog rev counter still in the center. Um. It's what it, it feels. There's an argument that with these screens in there, a lot more sort of tech in there, and the I saw somebody comment, it's now a Panamera Coupe. And it, I, I think that's a, actually quite clever. It is, yeah. and there's you know an argument that the, the driving is going down that route as well, potentially, which we'll again we'll come back to in a minute. But sort of you know, is it becoming this thing that's not a pure 911 anymore because it's that much more usable every day? But and it's a lovely thing to sit in. One of the things I do like is the fact that whereas before we've had that sort of very upright um, central tunnel, which you'd expect with everything sort of 
going vertically, I suppose, splitting the cabin. Yeah. And now it's much more, you get into it and you feel that it's a very horizontal cabin in front of you, which harks back to sort of, if you get into a, you know, a very original 911 from the 60s, uh, it's got that sort of feel where you, you didn't have anything between uh, the dashboard and then the footwells, yeah. really. So it was just this long strip along there. And that's that's what it feels like to me anyway when I, mm. when I got into it, which was, was quite nice, actually. So you've got a bit of that feel to it retro and modern well you didn't get to drive on this occasion but we can confirm that we will be getting henry in the car in the new year as soon as we possibly can (laughs) for some driving impressions which we'll be able to bring you from what you've read about the changes to the car and just from having sat in it what are you what do you think is going to be from a driving dynamic point of view the most noticeable differences between the 992 and the 991.2 I suppose the the fact is now you can have rear wheel steer as an option. I think um, I think it's yeah. I'm sure it's an option, not a not a standard. But adding rear wheel steer into a into a Carrera is going to help that a lot because we know how that just shortens the wheelbase virtually, as it were, um, and adds agility. But I think for for me the the widening of that front track, I hope the steering is better. That's the thing I really want. It's it's improved all the way through. 991 um, and the obviously the 991 GT3 um, Gen 2 the steering of that is fabulous and that's what I want I want some more of that in the standard yeah. Carrera I don't think that should be reserved for GT cars because it's such a core Porsche 911 thing that I don't think it makes the car any harder to live with having that extra steering feel um, I think it just it makes the car come like it's a sports car and that's where you should have that. If you don't want accusations of it being a Panamera Coupe, yeah. then you ought to bring the steering in. Because if you give steering, then it's it's enjoyable at all sorts of speeds. There are some accommodations being made in the platform now for, is it hybridization or electrification? How do they refer hybridization to Hybridization is what they say. So there's something, the, the reason for switching the PDK gearbox from uh, the old seven speed, which was on a three shaft input to the new eight speed, which is on a four shaft input is to allow room between um, that and the, to, to basically add the hybridization in there because they make it shorter mm. um, is what I understand. It's also made it heavier, which is part of the reason. Well, yeah. hybridization isn't going to make it lighter. No, it is um, not. It's, it's, it's interesting because we've seen obviously off the back of the uh, 918 Spider and then the Panamera hybrids that have been working you know, quite well and, mm. uh, and it works within that platform. But it's a bigger car, you yep. can accommodate it more, you can forgive it being heavier. Mm-hmm. What would you think to a hybridized 911? Can well, you would hope that, this being Porsche, you would hope that it's going to be included uh, for performance as much as efficiency. That Because, again, we're coming back to it being a sports car. Yeah, it's We have the Panamera and that sort of thing where, yes, that's going to be for efficiency primarily. I get if you want to drive your sports car in you know, London or somewhere like that, then the ability to drive it on electric only is terrific. You would think with obviously sort of things like torque fill, um, that will help performance. These are the things that I'm not sure necessarily add to the the joy of driving sort of torque fill. It's great. It's going to yeah. it makes it more seamless, but then CVT makes it more seamless. It doesn't make it a better, more enjoyable car to drive. So it certainly doesn't, no. Um, I like the idea of it just being on recuperation and then using the spon- sport response button as a push to pass, <laughs> where you don't, where because all that does is really engage Sport Plus yeah. for a couple, so you're yeah. not getting anything extra, but have it literally like queued up, ready to go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. a go yeah, baby go button, yeah. and just <laughs> and then blast out your battery just for an extra hundred yards of uh, of extra pace. That could blitz that two thousand one Nova into the wind. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as much as like nine elevens are probably the more fun end of what we cover um we live in suv world where suvs are the yes you may roll your eyes and um but everyone's getting in on it and we've seen porsche uh, one of the first to bring in the idea of the performance luxury yeah, it's SUV. All their but aston martin have thrown their hat into the ring mm. and uh, andy palmer announced the name very recently as it's going to be called the dbx I see what they did there, yeah. DB and like X, like cross country. So cross much, country yeah. or Ooh. extreme. And yeah. They, yeah, they've shown it under camel uh, and some concept drawings. Uh, so it's been out driving on the Welsh rally stage, mm-hmm. um, showing that it, you know, they can be thrown about. Um, I mean, you can throw pretty much anything you want about it. You put the right driver really, in a car, yeah, not- you can, <laughs> you definitely can. So, 
can't say it's a looker from what I've seen of it. It has kind of a bit of a BMW X6 Wh- which vibe. Which of them are, is, is there an SUV that really looks good? Yes. Yes, I can think of one. And, uh, well, I really like the, the Velar. Uh, I think the Velar looks really, really nice. Okay. Um, which actually uh, comes on to another car because apart from the DBX, which is uh, still under camouflage, we haven't got a huge amount of information about it. Mm. Um, the Evoque has been uh, overhauled, redesigned. and so They basically took the Velar and, and just, just went minimized by... 10%. Yeah, that is the criticism that a lot of people have thrown at it. Um, Pinch and zoom. I went to the <laughs> unveil. Oh, we've got that. Oh, you got it. <laughs> that, that's basically car design. So you don't have to go to university to do car design. You just take the picture of a car, you squish it a little bit, then you've got a new car. That's, <clears throat> according to Henry Catchpole, that's just how it works. Um, I went to the uh, new Evoke launch and was chatting there. Did you take swimming trunks with you? I did. Um, uh, there was a swimming pool there. Uh, but that's another story uh, no no tell us well they made us made us they allowed us to drive the car <laughs> you will in a, swimming pool. you don't <laughs> usually at these unveils like at the 911 they don't usually allow you to drive the car which is fine because the car's not necessarily ready yet but in mm-hmm. a very controlled environment in railway arches in the depths of East London they allowed us to drive a course that they built essentially indoors um, through kind indoor of, swimming pool then there, there was an indoor swimming pool there mm-hmm. that they'd repurposed as a... Do you have to take a shower beforehand? No. Well, what I did try and do was <laughs> there was a ramp that you drove into. Did you wear you, Veruca socks? I didn't wear Veruca... <laughs> I was in a car, Henry. <laughs> oh, okay. Do people still did, wear did, Veruca did, socks? Did the car wear Veruca socks? The car did not wear Veruca <laughs> socks. I can't take them anywhere. Um, they had like rubber you, shoes on. You drove in... <laughs> yes, it was wearing, that's what tires are. <laughs> they are rubber shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we drove in a ramp into a swimming pool mm. and then turned and then drove out another ramp. It, it looks more like a blend between Velar and the old Evoke. You can definitely tell it has kind of that Evoke style. Crossfade, minimize. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the narrow aperture rear window is still very much a thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Apparently, the only thing it has in common with the, the previous generation of Evoke are the door hinges. And made me ask the question, what was so good about those door hinges? Yeah. Like they, every nut and bolt has been redone on that car, but they had the door hinges. <laughs> they stood there just going, <laughs> these are, on that. I mean, look are really good <laughs> door hinges. The looks of the Velar, it's taking the new Land Rover design language, which is minimalist and uh, mo- modernist, not just modern. Um, and they're making very, very attractive cars. And they're, they're adding technology to it in a way that's quite interesting. The uh, rear view mirror uh, it's a single button switch between traditional rear view mirror and a wide angle camera. This gives you a wider angle of view, really crisp image, works at night and obviously can't dazzle you because it's um, not uh, like a traditional mirror, um, which looked really cool. But another car that I've driven uh, just yesterday uh, was the new Audi e-tron, mm. which... Um, Where did you drive it? I drove it in Abu Dhabi. The Audi e-tron is an all-electric uh, Audi, and we've had. And doesn't that have yes cameras? Exactly. Yeah, that is yeah. the first time I believe in a production car. We've seen it in concepts oh, since for years. Yeah, uh, you know, as long as I've been doing cars, and it's the it's the one thing you can always say from a concept. Well, that's not going to last. Yeah. This is the first time I've actually seen it. Mm. So the the side mirrors are cameras, and the the. The little bullet cam sort of type things. Yeah, they're they're, they're, yeah. they're they're not tiny. They're okay. just fairly substantial. Did you ever catch? Did you catch yourself looking at them, going, oh, "Yes, I can't see anything." There's yeah, that's that's exactly what you do. It looks like someone like it's knocked your mirror off, and you look at it. And you go, <laughs> oh. Where is it? The screen for it is built into your door, and it's just forward of the handle to open the door. It essentially eliminates blind spots, yep. which is very clever. That's good. It's got bliss. Um, blind spot uh, indicators built in around the edge so it Mm -hmm. flashes around it if you've got something in there so you always I always had to correct it that will probably go away Um, I really liked the idea we found some limitations with it Uh, it was quite a reflective screen so when you look over and on a bright day you see as much the reflection of the person in the passenger seat but weird advantages that I hadn't thought of um, you'll know if you've been in the passenger seat of a car you can't see properly out of the side mirror because it's angled for the Uh, driver whereas you both see the same image so you can both be checking the mirrors Mm. which is I guess handy 
uh, the the film is out on the channel and you can read uh, our friend and colleague Mr. Tim Stevens was out there as well and he's done a full write up on the car um, it is the interior is just like an Audi like you, if it feels like an A8 or a Q8 like all the bells and whistles and the new Audi infotainment system is it interesting to drive I'm not convinced but I, I argued in the piece that it is a very important car because when companies yeah. like Audi and Jaguar um like commit themselves to making electric cars it really shows that it was fine with tesla doing it that is all they do it's a step forward it's a newcomer they're disrupting the industry and that's great but as soon as the big players start to do it and start to apply all of their decades and decades of knowledge of building cars marketing them maintaining them and customer support it really tips the balance and yeah. We're not there yet in terms of everyone should go and their next car should be electric. But if it makes sense for you, there is now an Audi that you can buy that yeah. is a competent car. Um, that's pretty expensive, isn't it? Still, but. It's still very expensive. So that that's something you have to Can we talk about some sports cars, please? Yeah, it's going to talk can about we, some sports please? cars. Yeah. And I know you like SUVs, but it's going to... Yeah. I don't. Because <laughs> uh, elsewhere at LA, there were sort of... it was. LA was basically dominated by the 992, wasn't it? It was a um, good LA, actually. There's quite a lot of... In, yeah, yeah. There, what, well, there were a two other things. This is the, um, so Porsche decided they were just going to go, just in case they hadn't captured the headlines enough, they announced the GT2 RS Club Sport, which is track only. I think they're only building 200 of them. Um, that's not enough. No, I know, but then... They could is, sell 10 times it, that, but that's the yeah, point. Yeah, but yeah, 400,000 euros each plus taxes. So They'd find buyers for it. Yeah, I know they would. And it, the interior shot is basically like a cup car. Um, it's, it's a race car. The only thing that's left is the PDK selector um, in the middle. The rest is all sort of it's FI, full FI seat. It's got a, the cool steering wheel without the top on it and the proper kind of stack. Um, readout and things like that so yeah apparently they are actually talking to uh, SRO the motorsport promoter who do Blancpain and mm -hmm. um, British GT and stuff like that to potentially try and get it included in sort of or be allowed to race which would be pretty cool so people won't just turn up at track days and go hey look <laughs> um, they can actually race it which would be, that would be really cool wouldn't it to see a GT2 RS racing yes. I think that would be pretty mega slightly perhaps took the sting out of because I, I reckon mercedes must have gone well they've got the nine and two but we're gonna have the track element we've got the, the hardcore fans covered off and then porsche went and did that yeah. which kind of then instantly because it's track only kind of made the mg gtr pro yes um, which does actually for professionals for prof well yes no not the, um. the, the, you know, the gtr <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that wasn't that's for weekend amateurs yeah, that car exactly. clearly yeah I mean, I'm sure it'll be great it's got adjustable of collar will, suspension yeah. and a few little extra aerodynamic tweaks so it looks even more aggressive it just feels like a stock gap we're waiting for the black series to come out there will be a black series I'm sure yeah so I'm sure they've teased I'm sure they've said there's going to be one and it just feels like just get there already otherwise that car's going to be just obsolete by the time is, is the pro um, suffix is that going to be a thing now are they going to add know. that to other cars? Mm, maybe. Is that going to be somewhere between, you get the AMG version, then you get the AMG Pro version, and then you get the black version. Oh, it's going to be know. like a slight it's gonna, scale. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, I it's a bit Apple adding a Pro into Pro, the, okay, to, yes, to, I see what you mean. To, yes, to yeah, distinguish absolutely. it from, from another piece. Yeah. Was there anything else sports car related that you wanted oh, to Oh, yes, there was, um, which wasn't at LA, um, because there's only one of them in the world, and it's just been picked up by its owner from Ferrari. Uh, it's a one-off. It's called the SP3JC. Uh, it's based on the F12 TDF, and it's an open top, um, as they do these special commission cars occasionally. Is that like the cars we saw in Paris? Uh, yes, a little bit, but this is on the TDF, so it's got yep. that really aggressive um, chassis, whereas they're based on the 812. Um, right, so but from the same, a, the same idea, bespoke. Y yes, except they're going to build, I think, f what is it, 500 overall of the SP1 and SP2. Um, yeah. not quite sure how they did it up whereas this is literally a, a one-off for uh, a chap called John Collins in fact who I interviewed last year uh, who set up a dealership called Talacrest and he's said he's, he's he is said to have sold more Ferraris than anyone else um, then you get your own bespoke Ferrari I guess. and yes and he's a massive sort of he was always his dealership was just down the road from Marinella Concessionaires which was the official UK Ferrari importer uh, and I remember going to sort of you know press my 
grubby six-year-old nose up against his um, glass windows to look in <laughs> through the, at the cars. And Glad often the cars in there were better than the ones in the official Ferrari dealership. It was that sort of thing. And he was the guy that, um, you remember Chris Evans had the white collection, the yeah. Ferraris, so he curated that for Chris Evans and that sort of thing. And uh, the livery is... He obviously loves it. It's sort of inspired by pop art, apparently. Um, so pretty big, bold, blocky colours with white and white and blue and then sort of yellow accents in it. So, yeah, I'm sure it sounds amazing. Mm. Roof off. That engine, what's not to like? On to motorsport. Yeah, let's do some motorsport. Now, obviously, there's been quite a lot going on. Mainly some seasons have uh, finished uh, and a couple of big crashes, actually, as well. Sophia Flourish's mm. um, uh, F3 crash at... Um, Macau mm. was um, obviously a couple of weeks ago, and the fact that she, uh, well, I say walked away, but is is mm. relatively unscathed, uh, is nothing short of a miracle. It's like a bullet. The car yeah. going into one of the tightest hairpins on the circuit with no brakes, oh. uh, flying through oh. the air. Did you, did you see the Abu Dhabi F2 race uh, just before the Abu Dhabi Formula One, no. where one of the cars stalled on the? Um, uh, on the on the starting grid, mm. and the car behind it we- weaved around it, but the car behind it didn't, didn't. and just launched off it at uh, Charlie in the uh, in the stand. And he, there's a video of him just seeing this car coming straight at him. He ducks. But speaking of Formula One, the uh, the season is done. Yep, uh, we already knew that. Uh, uh, um, that Hamilton, the, won. Hamilton won the drivers' championship, and that Mercedes would have the uh, the drivers' championship, but. I guess at the end Lewis got to take home a uh, a win as the final final race yes, as well. Yeah. It was actually quite an interesting race. There's quite a few um, duels going on up and down uh, the ranks, as it were. Um, Nico Hockenberg having a horrific skip off the track on like, the first lap. I just had it on in the background and turned over, and his car was in mid air. Oh yes, I did from, see that from yes, just from yeah. just what looked like a slight bump. But again, it showed the the both the um, benefits of and the limitations with the halo because the, he landed up against the fence not a scratch on him but then it was a lot harder for him to get out the car mm. which was on fire what did you think of this season as a whole it was okay yeah I thought the first half of it was a lot more entertaining <laughs> than the second half of it we saw yeah it was sadly um, Vettel and Ferrari faded in the second half of the season didn't they it was it was I'm not sure it was the case of the tracks not seating them uh, quite as well um, or Vettel certainly seemed to make um, a few errors where Hamilton just stepped up and he is extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I know I've said it before, but he his racing ability and the fact that he he doesn't tend to get stuff wrong very often and he also doesn't send, seem to make the, the errors of um, moral judgment, ethical judgment in the way he races that others have in the past. You know, his hero Senna, you know, he's certainly not. You know, no, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't play quite as dirty as Senna was capable no, of doing. No, and Schumacher and and Vettel has proved. You know, he can. You know, he's turning into Hamilton and that sort of thing. And yeah, it, it's not for all that Hamilton. Yes, he can be petulant. Come on, guys. You know, over the radio or whatever. Like that. He's not in his driving. He keeps it. He doesn't do I things. Think, I think that's purely from a self-preservation thing that he knows that you rarely come out on top by doing that. But yeah, I don't think... But, but it's that hot-headedness of the others. You know, that was all... I, I, they were all actions before of somebody that's not thinking clearly or has an inner... They're so competitive that they mm. can't bear to see somebody else win. Um, and Hamilton has somehow got that... Well, as yet, I, I hope he keeps a, a, a clean sheet. Um, on this front, because I think it is something that makes him stand out, even from the other greats. Well, how did the rally championship <laughs> end up? I know you're itching to tell me. <laughs> uh, well, it's, I mean, it's a case of you know, plus a change, I suppose, in the same way. OGA won overall, same as Hamilton won in F1. It, yeah. If you were just dipping in, you go, oh, same as same as always. But it was the most fabulous WRC season in terms of it. There were still three drivers in convention contention going into the Australia, Australia, which is the last round. It was such a good season to watch because you never knew where it was going. All the cars seemed really pretty evenly paced across the season, which was good. Some were definitely better in different conditions, so it wasn't just a, it was not like a one mate championship. And then we had just one of the best rallies ever outright in Spain, um, which was mixed surface. Everybody at that point in the championship just driving flat out trying to get 
as many points as possible because you had to say the three championship contenders all all going for it um Yari Mata Latvala's been on something of resurgence in the second half of the season as well he's been really fired up which is nice to see um and then you threw a certain Mr Loeb into the mix who's you know comes back um and beat them all yeah with an inspired tire choice on the Sunday morning, but then still held them all off in the second round of um, the stages on Sunday when they were all on the same tire. And we knew full well that um, OJ, he he wanted that win badly and he couldn't beat Loeb. And that is just extraordinary for, for somebody to come back. Um, we know how difficult comebacks are in motorsports, but to come back and win in a totally new set of you know rules and regulations in terms of the car with just minimal testing against the cream of the current generation at the top of their game mixed surface rally no adv- no obvious advantages sort of in terms of road position yeah just extraordinary it, it must really bug Ogier because Ogier never beat Loeb kind of obviously head to head one thing that connects uh, rallying to Formula One, which we didn't mention, is Williams' new signing for next year. Yes. With uh, Kubica making a return to Formula One after, well, a while. Eight years, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It, it's a while. It's a big gap, but also an eventful gap yeah. with more than a couple of uh, incidents along the way, none, none the least of which is almost losing an arm. Yeah. And to come back from that, not only survive it and get back into motorsport, mm. But I think there was some rumour of him being test driver for Ferrari a couple of weeks ago, and then news broke. Um, I actually uh, found out from someone who was working quite close to Williams that it was happening before it broke in the news. I was like, that's kind of a surprise. Mm. And uh, But it's it's it, it's impressive. I mean, whether or not he'll, how well he'll do next year remains to be seen. Yeah, uh, it, it's extraordinary. It's, it's such a good story, mm. sort of... Um, you know, he he obviously has huge huge talent. He loves motorsport, loves driving. Hence the fact, the reason the crash happened in the first place. You know, he's off doing rallying, which he mm. he loved yeah. and sort of just loved driving cars. I've heard to, they've had to, to a, a, a loosen some FIA rules to permit him to really? drive. Yeah, yeah, which you know is is unsurprising, really. Yeah. If you consider just the steering wheel and the volume of controls both hands need to yeah. do just to start the thing off the line, Absolutely. I'm not surprised. But the fact that Williams are are going with it it's it's brilliant it is fantastic yes mm. it's, and it's not you know clearly it is not just a it's not just a PR stunt you know, they don't have they don't, you know, they, they don't have the luxury of no. it just being a PR stunt they exactly. need a good driver yes yeah so yeah that's going to be great see so, how it does so uh, yes so Formula 1 next season will be interesting rallying will be interesting I think uh, in the footlocks in the run up um, especially the rallying, I think it might be quite interesting to go over with people how best to follow it, and maybe how if they, yeah. if twenty nineteen is going to be your first season for following uh, rallying. And to a certain extent, I'm in that boat as well because I don't follow it. Maybe you can guide me through watching yeah, sure. it, and we yep. can we can help you at home get into rallying. So before too long, you'll be just as well versed on the uh, international <laughs> drivers and courses as Mister Catchpole is. <laughs> Now, thank you very much for making it all the way to the end of another Footlock. We know that if you are still watching or indeed listening to the podcast at this point, that you are one of our biggest fans and we'd like to thank you. And if you haven't already subscribed to the audio podcast, you can find that anywhere where you listen to podcasts by looking for Carfection for the Love of Cars. Uh, And if you subscribe, you'll be able to hear an extended edition of this and other little treats uh, on your podcast feed. Uh, And on YouTube, if you aren't already subscribed, you definitely should be. But if you haven't hit the bell icon underneath this video next to the subscribe button so that you're notified, well, then you're missing out. So hit the bell icon to make sure you don't miss a single video that we put out. And we will have some amazing stuff for the remainder of the year and into the... Well, the new year. God, that's come around really quickly, hasn't it? Uh, we remember, you can follow us on Facebook. Just search for Carfection. On Instagram, we are Carfection Films. And on Twitter, we are at Carfection. You can find Mr. Henry Catchpole wherever you find people on social media, <laughs> at Henry Catchpole. And you can find me at Drew Stern in all the same places. So all that remains to say is thank you very much. Thank you, Henry, for joining me again in the studio. Not at all. Thank you for giving me a slightly taller microphone. Is that intentional? Yes, you're a taller person. It's all on purpose here at Carfection. We'll see you again for a special episode of Footlock coming very, very soon, potentially even right on Christmas Day. Uh, yeah, extra Christmas present for you. Uh, Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, goodbye. Cheers.